Good morning. Thank you guys for joining us on this wintry morning. I will give you guys a few seconds to log in. About another 30 seconds and then I'll get started. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Just Not trying to, the kids are, are headed out the door for, for school. <laughs> yeah, I, I opened it up. People started logging in. I figured I'd go over my spiel. Fantastic. So welcome uh, to our Tuesday webinar on Complete Streets. Dan will be your instructor today. As most of our webinars, the chat is disabled. So if you do need to get in contact with us, you can throw it in the Q&A. All the questions for today's webinar will be answered at the end. If, and if they're not, we'll send them on to Dan or David and we'll get you your answers that you're looking for. Um, there, It is PDH worthy today. So you have to be on for 90% of the webinar. If you are outside of New York State, you can contact your local LTAP center and they will handle your PDHs. New York, if you're in New York State, we got you covered. Um, we'll start with a poll. So the first one is I work for. So do you work for the town, the county, city or village, state or federal, tribal, private, or the weekend? So someone in the Q&A has the government. Looks like we have a good chunk of city and village, some private town and county. And then our second poll question, my job is um, administration, highway superintendent, DPW commissioner, engineer, field crew, board member, or none of the above. If it is none of the above, you can throw it in the Q&A. Well, and looks like we have majority of engineers, some administration, some highway DPW, and some field crew. And with that, I will turn it over to Dan, and we'll get started. Thanks so much, Amanda. And good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us to talk about complete streets today. Um, I'm going to kick things off uh, just by introducing myself really quickly. My name is Dan Sarasi. Uh, I specialize in active transportation planning and bicycle mobility. Uh, my company, Urban Cycling Solutions, does this work all over New York State. Uh, we're really excited about pilot projects, uh, but also big picture plans. So we've worked on the Long Island Greenway. We wrote the New York Cycling Census. Uh, we also are working on NYSDOT's statewide active transportation plan right now. So this is what we live and breathe and do. Um, Today, we're gonna to talk about a lot of different things. We're gonna talk about complete street policy briefly. I know we have a lot of engineers on the call, so we're, we're gonna to get to uh, design and uh, you know the tools that we use as quickly as possible. We're also gonna talk about implementation, funding, and maintenance, and we're gonna round things out by talking about performance management today. So a lot of content to get through. Uh, I, this was already mentioned, but please ask all the questions you like in the chat. We will answer as many as we can today, but anything we don't get to, I'm happy to answer in writing afterward. However, before we get going with any of the content, uh, I wanna put out a disclaimer there, um, especially for my engineers in the room. I am not here today uh, to tell you that you need to rip out all of your parking and put in bike lanes and stuff like that. That's not my goal, and that's frankly not the goal of Complete Streets. What we're here to do today is to rethink the way that we perceive our streetscape. So typically, when we think about a street or a sidewalk, we're thinking about a place where cars go, where transportation happens, and where people walk. Uh, the, not with the streets, obviously. Uh, the, the places to pe where people walk are, you know, it, it really depends on the quality of the sidewalk. Um, Having said that, what I want you to think about today is the idea that streets are public spaces. These are uh, thoroughfares that are 
designed, operated, and maintained using tax dollars, which means we all own them. So what I'm going to challenge you with today is to think of what the highest and best use of that public space is, right? Uh, so it could be a car thoroughfare, a place where transportation happens, or a place where people walk, or it could be any number of things. These could be, streets can be economic development catalysts, which drive higher public health outcomes, increase uh, street safety, uh, create unique places where people want to live, work, and play. And yes, of course, produce uh, mobility, not just for cars, but for walkers, for bikers, for scooters, et cetera, um, and create both accessibility and engagement for anyone in our community. So you'll hear me ask this again and again today, what is the highest and best use of our public streetscapes? And again, we're not here to say, oh, well, putting bike lanes in is always the highest and best use. It's not. Sometimes bike lanes don't make sense. Sometimes you need certain types of parking. What I want to say right now is that bike lanes, curb extensions, speed bumps, et cetera, these are all tools in our toolkit to achieve whatever your community goals is. That's what Complete Streets is all about. It's about figuring out what the highest and best use of the streetscape is for your community, and then choosing which tools to use to get there. So having said that, let's dive right in. Active, transport and com active transportation complete streets. So what are complete streets? These are streets that are designed and operated to enable safe access for all users, including pedestrians, bicyclists, motorists, and transit riders of all ages and abilities. When we do complete streets right, we're doing all these things, right? We're increasing roadway safety. We're producing better environmental outcomes. We're increasing choice for consumers and visitors. We're making sure that everyone has access to all of the key destinations in our community. We're creating unique places where people want to live, work, and play, like I said earlier. And we're creating an environment that produces better public health outcomes. When we do complete streets well, particularly in our downtowns and, and uh, commercial thoroughfares, we can stir economic vitality. And of course, by creating choice, by increasing safety, we're increasing equitable mobility for uh, users, street users of all ages and abilities. So Complete Streets is also about efficiency, and this is a great illustration of what that means. So if you take a busload of people and you put them on a streetscape like this, this is how much space it takes up on the roadway. Very efficient for the amount of people that it makes. If you take that same busload of people and you put them on bikes, it takes up a little bit more space, but still very, very efficient. Now, if you take the busload of people and you put them all in cars, suddenly the entire streetscape is taken up by cars. Now, I am not here to suggest that we should only be biking and taking the bus because that's not practical and it's not the way that transportation works in New York State, particularly in more rural areas. What I am suggesting, however, is if we enable people to choose biking and transit much more easily, suddenly imagine what would happen if we offset 50% of these car trips, right? If we remove this lane and this lane of cars, suddenly we've had we've had we would have two full lanes of traffic to do any number of things with, right? So we could create a transit priority lane. We could create buffered bike lanes or some combination of both. Not that you need it. You could also expand the sidewalk and create more uh, walkable space here. The point is that by leveraging complete street design principles we can figure out what the best and most efficient use of this streetscape is in our community. From an environmental standpoint, transportation accounts for the largest share of carbon emissions in New York State. So again, if we can shift away from car trips to more efficient modes like transit, biking, walking, etc., we can really make a big dent in our transportation emissions. From an equity standpoint, 
Owning a car is really expensive, especially if you're living at or below the poverty line. Uh, according to AAA, in 2020, the annual cost of owning a car was about 9500 bucks, including maintenance, gas, insurance, parking, etc. Um, and that is a really, really big barrier, uh, especially if you're, um, you know, again, living at or below the poverty line and the car is the only way for you to get somewhere. Now, in terms of economic development, there's a lot of studies out there that tell us that uh, complete streets lead to increased employment, increased property value, and increased local spending over time. Um, I'm happy to share some of these studies with you afterward, but this is a huge boon for economic development in New York State communities, and we've seen it all over the state. Complete street projects are, uh, are implemented. And suddenly there are more people walking, there are more people biking and patronizing local businesses in downtown commercial thoroughfares. Placemaking. So I mentioned this earlier, but, you know, our, our streets aren't just places that we're, we're walking or driving or transporting. Our streets are an area where we can, can create a unique experience. So when you're going to uh, Ithaca or you're going to Binghamton or somewhere in New York, you can leverage streetscapes and sidewalks to create a unique experience that really draws people in. So that's an overview of complete streets. What we're gonna talk about now very briefly is policy. So again, I know I have a lot of engineers on the phone, um, but if you do the work up front and you get engaged in the policy making process, it's gonna save you a lot of time down the road and it's also going to make it a lot easier to implement these projects in the long run. So I'm going to give a very quick overview. So why do you need a complete street policy? <clears throat> well, it represents an official mandate to work toward an integrated transportation network for all users. It also establishes a reporting framework and sort of a guiding vision and methodology. So from a technical standpoint, it can a, a really good complete street policy can have something like this. This is from Albany's Complete Street Policy and Design Guide. And what they've done is they have very clearly spelled out what types of infrastructure are going to be prioritized on what type of roadway within any given land use context. And this hierarchy makes it a lot easier to say, OK, these are the projects that we're going to prioritize given limited funding in these different areas. Now, this is a really technical way to do it, and it's really in the weeds. Um, or you can have more of sort of like a, a, a visionary approach, right? Instead of being very technical, you can say, hey, we're going to prioritize safe routes to school, which can mean a number of different things, right, in different locations. So uh, this is more of a, let's call it a soft policy approach, but it still establishes a priority framework and helps us figure out where we want to prioritize investments and focus our efforts when it comes to complete streets. Now, I don't want to go through this in detail. There's a lot of great resources for creating a strong complete street policy. Um, but, you know, most great complete street policies have a clear vision and goals attached to them. Um, one piece I want to call out here are exceptions. When you're going through the policymaking process, it is really important that you think through what exceptions are, number one, and number two, what the process is for gaining an exception. You never want to have a blanket exception that says these projects are going to be exempt from this policy. You want to make sure that any projects moving forward flow through some sort of uh, rigorous process, whether it's having a complete street re committee review it first and make a recommendation to a commissioner, something along those lines. Uh, you want to make sure that you're, you're very clear about exceptions because this is where a lot of policies fall flat. Um, another uh, piece that I want to point out is adopting great design guidelines. So oftentimes local design standards or even county design standards don't necessarily have things like curb extensions built into them. Um, so making sure that your policy has the flexibility to either amend the guidelines or look elsewhere 
let's say to NACTO or AASHTO standards um, is really important. And then uh, lastly, I, I will just note measuring progress. You, you wanna make sure you're building in performance management to your policy so you know what your big picture goals are. And we will talk a little bit about that at the end. So these are some resources I recommend you check out as far as policy making goes. Uh, the Smart Growth America has this really fantastic uh, Complete Street Policy Framework, which contains uh, detailed explanations of all of these different elements of a policy. Uh, and then the Albany just has a really fantastic guide. It's a little old at this point. Uh, we're calling things from 2012 old, but it, it is fantastic. They did a really good job laying out the policy and the design pieces. One last note about policy that I think will be relevant to everybody on this webinar. Earlier this year, uh, New York State passed a new law, or we'll call it the Complete Street Law, which increases funding for Complete Street projects in New York State. So the state match, if you're pursuing a state grant for a project that includes Complete Street elements, has been raised from 80% to 87.5%. And if you are getting a federal grant with a local match component, um, they haven't worked out the details of this, but the state has the prerogative to fund your local match up to 100%, depending on the priority of the project. Um, a lot of this is still being worked out at New York State DOT, so I can't answer specific questions about the when and the process and such. But I will say this, as you're thinking about projects for 2024 and beyond, make sure that you are integrating complete street principles wherever you can, because there's more money on the table than there ever has been before for these projects. So let's get into the meat. Let's talk about what complete streets actually look like. And I want to start off with uh, a couple uh you know, guiding principles here. First is that correct design invites correct use. And you see a good illustration of that here. On the left, you have a roadway with no curbs, no pavement delineation, nothing. Uh, which means this dude can, oh, I'm sorry, this guy here, he can cross anywhere he wants to. These cars have no lanes, so their lane positioning will vary widely from one driver to another. And when you give cars more space, studies show that they tend to go faster. In contrast, here you have a very cleanly designed street. You have clear crosswalks. You have very bright ADA compliant uh, curb cuts here. It's clear that this is a place where you're supposed to be crossing the road. It's clear that this is how cars should be positioned on the roadway. It just makes the street more predictable for all users. Another sound bite I will give you here is that context matters. And uh, what you have here is a beautiful, brand new ADA compliant curb ramp to nowhere, uh, except a very tall retaining wall. This makes no sense. It connects to no other pedestrian accessible pedestrian infrastructure. Um, we wanna make sure that we're not planning complete streets in a vacuum and doing it just because. We want to make sure we're connecting and we're creating a connected network. So the first step in designing for Complete Street is recognizing patterns. And this can mean a lot of different things. A couple options to think about. One, are there goat paths in your community? So goat paths are uh, evidence of informal travel. And you can see that right here. This is a well-worn path. Sometimes people feel safer. Sometimes it's a shortcut that, that makes it easier for people to get to school or work or whatever. These are worth noting because if they're heavily trafficked and it's not too much of a burden, maybe we should think about formalizing these paths. Uh, bikers are a great source of information as far as roadway safety goes. Why are bikers choosing certain routes? Why do they avoid certain routes? So in a very real sense, if you're planning a bike network, absolutely talk to cyclists because they'll they'll give you firsthand information. But more broadly, if you talk to somebody who bikes around a lot, you're going to get good information about general roadway safety, no matter what project you're doing. Now, every community that I go to uh, has 
what I call whispers in the back room, you know, oh, they've been talking about redoing that intersection for years or, oh, they were going to turn that into a trail a decade ago and it never happened. These things stick in the public consciousness for a reason and are worth investigating because there's clearly interest. And then most importantly, where do kids hang out? Um, you know, kids are arguably our most vulnerable roadway users. So when we're talking about schools, playgrounds, libraries, we want to make sure that kids can get to these places easily and safely um, without having to worry about uh, traffic safety issues. So another piece here is choosing the right design given a, uh, a, the, a, a certain land use context. And I like to think of this as a stepladder. So in a downtown commercial context where there's higher traffic volume, your stepladder might look like this, where you prioritize walking, biking, and transit, and then other modes, right? So if you do it this way, you have an entire menu of design tools for each mode of transportation. Now, I'm not saying this is a ubiquitous modal stepladder, right? Your commercial context might be different. You might not have transit in your commercial uh, corridors, and that's fine. But the nice thing about the stepladder is that it enables you to sort of pick and choose and say, oh, you know what, instead of transit, you know, I think we do need to prioritize cars here, but we still want to prioritize walking and biking first. It lets you do that exercise and then helps you think through the design tools you should be thinking about. And I should note that, again, if you do your complete street policy right, this is some of the work that you would do up front. So now let's talk about design concepts. And I'm going to start with a road diet. So the idea behind a road diet is that for decades, uh, road design was focused on maximizing space for cars. Lanes were really wide. Um, and the fact is that cars just don't need all that space. Um, you know, I could get into, you know, the, the, the nitty gritties of history and, you know, how, you know, communities were incentivized to build wider roads and funding. And the, it, it's a very long, but I think interesting story. I'm a nerd, but we could talk about it offline. The bottom line is this. Cars just don't need all that space. Um, and these wide multi-lane roads are huge barriers to walking, bicycling, and other modes of transportation. So the idea of a road diet is that lanes can be narrowed to create additional space for other uses and create a safer roadway environment for everyone. Road diets also slow down traffic speeds. And this is really, really important um, because slowing down traffic saves lives. Study after study shows us. So in this instance here, if you look at data, uh, on, on fatalities from a crash at 40 miles per hour, there's an 85% chance of fatality. Just a 10 mile per hour drop in, in speed limit reduces that chance of fatality in half. And then another 10 miles per hour reduces that uh, chance of fatality to 5%. So this is really, really important. Now, when you narrow, how, how do road diets reduce speed. Well, when you narrow the travel lane for cars, they tend to go slower. So um, in this instance, you can see here, there's no delineation on the road. You can actually see the vehicle position varies from one car to another. Some are closer to the double yellow, some are farther away, closer to the parked cars. But if we take this extra space and we create clear delineation, uh, suddenly we've created extra space for a whole new use with this bike lane and we've narrowed the roadway which reduces traffic speed so as far as traffic calming and downtown design goes i said at the top of the hour there's no one size fits all solution here uh and i'm not here to throw tell you to throw bike lanes everywhere if you let's say have an existing two-lane main street like this there are so many different ways that you can apply different completed street design tools. Up here, you see a center median and a mid-block crossing. Here, you have another mid-block crossing, but then you have this chicane and a bike route. Uh, the chicane helps to slow down traffic speed along with uh, this uh, mid-block curb extension. And here, 
you retain the thoroughfare in, in a linear fashion here, but you also have a, a, a bike lane now. Again, it's up to you and what your priorities are within any given portion of your community. But there are many different ways that you can apply traffic calming and complete street design tools to any given roadway. Now, another concept I wanna talk about is intersection daylighting. And the idea behind daylighting is as you're coming to an intersection, I'm sure many of you have experienced this as a driver or a pedestrian, where you know if there's a parked car right next to the curb cut, you need to sort of step out into the road and peek over and see if there's a car coming. Daylighting addresses that issue by saying, let's move things away from the intersection so that as a driver is coming up, they have plenty of visibility and pedestrians can also see who is coming from any area in that intersection. Now, complete streets, you know, we tend to think about these in cities and downtowns, but there are also rural applications for complete streets as well. And you can see a couple examples of that here. Um, you know, speed bumps and speed tables can be put anywhere. There are mini roundabouts. I've seen this in many neighborhoods, uh, residential neighborhoods. Pinch points, again, I, I'm not a huge fan of these personally, but they are a tool for uh, slowing traffic speed. And again, this chicane lateral shift here is also something that can be applied in a rural setting. So we've talked about big picture concepts. What I wanna do now is open up the toolkit and sort of rummage around and see what's in there. So the first thing to talk about is curve extensions. These are really important uh, for a number of reasons. First and foremost, uh, they help us with that intersection daylighting issue, um, but they also short crossings for pedestrians and, and other users so that it's not as difficult to get across. Um, and believe it or not, curb extensions actually protect cars uh, because if you have a car parked right here, let's say, uh, and there is a right turning vehicle that takes a turn too hard, um, they're going to crash right into that car or they're going to sideswipe. The curb extensions force drivers to make more of a 90 degree turn and be more cognizant of what's on either side. Now, there are hard and soft ways to do curb extensions here. This is the hard way concrete. Um, but this example from New York City is the, we'll, we'll call it the soft way. Uh, this is just paint planters and some, some concrete bollards here. Um, and what's exciting about this, I mean, this is an unusual and a large example, but it's also become a public space. So you see seating, you see bikes, um, you know, so it's not just here for traffic calming purposes and to shorten the crossing. Speed bumps, you're all familiar with speed bumps. The most important thing with speed bumps is to make sure they are visible and where possible, make sure they are signed ahead of time. So it's not just people hitting a speed bump and saying, oh, geez, I didn't see it. I better slow down. It's, oh, I'm coming up to a speed bump. I better slow down. And then they slow down as they go through a series of speed bumps. Now, again, there are hard and soft ways to do this. There's the concrete and asphalt methods here, but you also can put in temporary speed bumps. Uh, as you see here, these are bolted into asphalt. Crosswalks. So crosswalks are actually really complicated uh, <laughs> pieces of, of design. Um, there's a lot of different ways you could do crosswalks. The most important things with crosswalks are they are as short as possible for pedestrians and they are super duper visible. So uh, if you're trying to shorten a crossing and you've got these sort of weird uh, points that aren't aligned, you can create a staggered crossing like this. Um, and you can also add uh, these RRFB beacons. They're just rapid flashing beacons that are pedestrian actuated to increase visibility farther down the road. You also, sorry, I keep skipping slides here. You can also create a signed, in, signed crossing like you see here. There's raised crossings, which double as speed bumps. Um, there's also the pedestrian scramble, which is officially the worst named piece of pedestrian infrastructure out there. I prefer to call these diagonal crossings, but uh, you might run into the scramble. These are two-way crossings. If you have two reds in either direction, you can do this. Um, it does take some getting used to for the general public, so you need to make sure that these are very clearly signed and marked. And 
at the high end, if you have all the money in the world, this is a really cool example uh, of increasing visibility. This is a picture I took in Malaga, Spain. This is a pressure sensitive crosswalk so that when you step on it, these LEDs embedded in the pavement, the pavement light up and cars automatically know to yield. And then when you step off, they start blinking, 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 and then the cars go. Very cool, but we don't always have all the money in the world to do stuff like that. Now, you also don't have to just wait for an intersection. If you have a long strip of a main street, you can put in a mid-block crossing uh, so that people don't have to walk all the way around the block to get to the other side. Same design principles apply here, and this doubles uh, as, as a benefit by providing mid-roadway traffic coming because it narrows the roadway wherever that crossing is. So when it comes to bike infrastructure, there's the good old fashioned, or th there's, there's several different types of bike infrastructure, right? So first there's the protected bike lane. This is the highest level of on-road protection you can get. Um, this method was perfected in New York City. And basically what you have here is curbside parking that was moved out 10 feet into the roadway. You have a buffer to prevent doors from opening onto cyclists. And then you have your five foot high visibility bike lane here. Um, you also have a bi-directional example of that down here. Now you don't need to necessarily do this only with vehicular parking. Um, you can also put in planters or some sort of other barrier to make this happen. But again, this is the highest level of protection you can get for on-road bicycling infrastructure. Now, more common is the good old fashioned bike lane when you have the space for it. Typically, uh, your standard bike lane width is gonna be five feet. In some instances, uh, particularly in downtown areas, you might see bike lanes that are painted a solid color to increase visibility. Uh, that does get very expensive though, so this is reserved for you know a very particularly busy area in Main Street or somewhere where there are traffic safety concerns. On the low end of our safety spectrum are shared routes. Uh, and these are exactly what they sound like. They are routes that are shared between cars and bikes. Basically, uh, you wanna make sure that these are signed all along the route. And also when you put a sharrow on the road, I showed this picture because it illustrates this misnomer with a shared route. So sometimes municipalities will print their sharrows off to the right of the lane. Sharrows should be printed center lane always. And the reason for this is cyclists are going to tend to follow those sharrows and ride over the sharrows, which means they're going to ride off center from the lane and closer to the parked cars. And this is a problem for two reasons. One, it opens them up to dooring uh, if somebody opens their car door. And number two, uh, drivers that are coming up to a cyclist that's not center lane are going to be far more likely to have that passing impulse, even on a double yellow. And when you are in a double yellow and you're not supposed to pass, they're not gonna wander too far over the double yellow. They're likely to pass way too close to a cyclist. So this creates a very dangerous environment for everyone. Sign your shared routes, make sure the sharrows are center lane. So you can't have a good bike network without somewhere to store your bikes when you're not riding. So bike parking is really key at your high volume destinations. So your downtown schools, libraries, post offices, grocery stores, etc. What's great about bike parking is that it has different uses, right? So there's the functional use of it, which is parking bikes, but also you can get really creative and leverage uh, bike parking as public art. So you can create sculptural elements like you see an apple and a pevy, penny farthing here. These were taken from Binghamton. Go Bike Buffalo funded a bunch of bike racks and has their logo. Um, there's so much cool stuff you can do with bike parking to create a more vibrant and interesting streetscape. The ultimate evolution of bike parking is a bike corral. And this is where you take a single parking stall or more, if you're being bold, and you swap it out for bike parking. And what I will say about this is... Uh, Harkening back to what I said at the beginning, which is what is the highest and best use of space, uh, of public space in your community? And is that parking for a single car or is it parking for eight to 10 bikes? 
you tell me. I'm not telling you what the answer is, but I will say one of the other benefits of a bike corral is that it increases visibility for local businesses. So you can actually see storefronts and not have them blocked by cars and vans and trucks. So when we're talking about pedestrian infrastructure, um, sidewalks are actually really complex spaces, right? It's not just a piece of concrete that you walk on. So a downtown commercial sidewalk might look like this, where you have this edge zone on the end where the street meets the curb. Um, you might have curbside parking. You might have parking meters. You might have bollards like this. Um, you will have a curb or a planter zone or a finishing zone uh, or a furnishing zone, sorry. And this is where you're going to find streetscaping, uh, like your trees. You might have some seating out here in front of a cafe. Your throughway zone is that walking piece. We want to make sure that's clear. And then you have your building frontage zone. And again, this can look very different. You know, maybe you have a shop with goods for sale. Maybe you have street seating in front of a restaurant or cafe. So again, when you start to think about a sidewalk and you break it down into different pieces like this, it helps you think about what the best design might be and what tools you can apply within a given context. Now, in more rural areas, you might it might not make sense to have sidewalks everywhere. So there are communities throughout New York State that have shared use sidewalks or side paths. And uh, this is an example from Rome here. These are essentially mixed use trails uh, that support cycling and walking um, in areas where sidewalks are not present. Now, the big thing with these is that you think about your transition points. You see here, how are bicyclists transitioning onto a side path and how are pedestrians crossing the roadway and such? I'm assuming here that these pedestrians are going somewhere over here because it wouldn't make sense for them to cross. Um, there are, are other treatments like the pedestrian lane. So again, if a sidewalk doesn't make sense or is impossible, you can take some roadway, uh, particularly in a rural context or a, uh, uh, a residential context and put in a marked pedestrian lane. Many New York State communities have uh, freight rail running through them, and there are a lot of different signs and treatments that you can apply here. Uh, one of the most important things when we're thinking about cyclists and non-car roadway users is making sure that bikes in particular or scooters or anything else uh, that's on two wheels are hitting those rails at a 45 degree angle or greater um, to reduce risk of getting caught in those rails. Now parking, I'm, I'm sure everybody on this call has dealt with parking for one reason or another. Uh, there's a lot of different types of parking. There's parallel parking, there's angled parking, and then there is reverse angle parking. So angled parking is going away. It is uh, fading fast because people realize that it is dangerous. And all of you who have ever parked in a diagonal parking spot know this danger when you're backing out, you cannot see. I mean, it's great if you have like a backup camera, but you really can't see if a cyclist is coming up behind you quickly. Now, reverse angle parking addresses this problem by literally flipping the issue on its head. So instead of pulling into a space, you pull forward and you back into a space. Now, it's really important, though, that you sign these with these sort of instructional signs and you message this to the public because it takes a lot of getting used to. Streetscaping and public art, a uh, very important tool in our toolkit because they create these unique places. Um, and studies show, you know, when you have a painted roadway like this, it actually slows down vehicles. They tend to go slower over these things. Now, we could spend a whole webinar on green infrastructure, but needless to say, there's a whole ecosystem of environmental considerations with complete streets, um, from dealing with stormwater runoff to uh, increasing shade and reducing heat. This is really important stuff uh, that you should be thinking about with your complete street projects. So let's apply some of these design principles quickly um, on some New York State roadways. So uh, I... Uh, silly me, I forgot to write down the municipalities these are in, um, but this is a fairly rural roadway, South Street and South Parsons Street. These are the existing conditions. What we see here 
Um, it's a nicely scaled intersection. It's not too big. Um, it seems approachable from a pedestrian standpoint. Um, there is an informal sidewalk here uh, where people are walking according to street view if you look at it. But unfortunately, there's no sidewalk whatsoever and there's no delineation with that informal sidewalk. Um, so it's good that there's indication that people are interested in walking here. There are no crossings whatsoever. Uh, there's a, a dead end curb that, that doesn't really go anywhere. Um, and then there's a, a redundant signal here. So I believe there's a stop sign and a signal, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So some things we can do to uh, make this intersection safer, um, we could extend this sidewalk to the intersection and we can put in curb extensions on all four corners. Now these are different shapes because in some instances, we don't need uh, as much room for, uh, or we don't have as much space for a curb extension, or we're only, you know, we only need to shorten the crossing a little bit depending on the roadway geometry. It just looks a little strange from this bird's eye view here. Adding a stop sign here, I think would be great. And also extending the sidewalk or, or repairing this sidewalk here would make this a lot safer. Um, also, obviously putting in crosswalks and curb cuts here would be really helpful. Another roadway, um, this is in Sago. This is River Street and Main Street on Route New York 7. Um, these are the existing conditions here. You can see this is a school. Um, so this is a very important crossing. Now, we have a lot to like here. Again, there's a school. It's an important use. Uh, we've got a T intersection, which means we have we don't have traffic coming from here. The crossings are fairly short, which is great. But unfortunately, there's no curb ramp here, so it's not very accessible. The crosswalks, while they're there, are pretty faded. And the curb here is really non-existent. It's just kind of informal. So again, not a lot of effort here. If we create a block-long curb extension to narrow the roadway within a school zone, which makes a lot of sense, um, we can shorten this crossing, especially if we pair it with curb extensions on the other side of the road. Similarly, putting in crossings and making, well, repainting the crossings will increase visibility here. Again, not a crazy intervention, but it'll make a ton of difference in terms of traffic speed and visibility for pedestrians. So those are just some uh, very quick examples of how these principles can be applied. Um, what we're going to talk about now is implementation, then we're going to round things out with performance management. So this is it, right? This is Complete Streets. We made it. Uh, so who, who? how did we get here? Well, obviously, the DPW or the Department of Transportation did it. No problem. Unless it was the county or maybe even worse, the state. Uh-oh. But then... On this roadway, you also have a transit agency operating, and you better believe they're going to be concerned about what their bus stop looks like and where it's positioned. Then, of course, you have the, the Chamber of Commerce, who's going to be really concerned about what you're doing in front of their business. And then you have a really diverse group of stakeholders doing different things on this roadway. So suddenly, this idyllic landscape just got really complicated. So... This is why I want to I wanted to go over a little bit of policy, because if you've done a good job at the policy stage, you've already done the implementation legwork. You've already restructured your existing plans. You've already updated design guidelines. You've already gone through the process of building buy in and educating staff and stakeholders. You also probably or at least should have some sort of committee to oversee the implementation of the complete street policy. So what next? Well, a good way to start is with pilot projects, um, which we'll talk about in a minute, and then measuring performance along the way. This is how you implement complete streets. Now, I mentioned New York State DOT. Um, I, I'm sure some people on this call can attest. Sometimes it's challenging to coordinate with different agencies, whether you're a local municipality co coordinating with your county or anyone you know, whether it's the county or a local municipality coordinating with DOT. Um, maybe you have a DOT roadway as your main commercial thoroughfare, which is really common in New York State. So when you're working with DOT, the first thing you want to do, 
Uh, you don't want to just go to them and say, this roadway stinks. You guys got to fix this. You really want to make sure that you're methodical and thinking through how you can move state DOT or get them to pay attention to a particular issue. So first, make your case, bring them the data and build the narrative. Look, we've had uh, you know, several fatalities and continue to have crashes at this intersection. We want to make it safer. And also, this is the gateway to our downtown. So we want to we want to make a change. Build support. Make sure that if there are local or regional plans that you're citing those. Get letters of support from the public or other stakeholders, whether it's business groups or major employers. Um, and if you're doing a workshop or a charrette, film it, take pictures, put all that together in whatever package you submit to DOT. Now, the best thing is if there's precedent. So if you've seen a similar state DOT project, even if it's in another city or town or village, you want to make sure that you put that in front of them as well as a concept to explore. Um, and then lastly, build your relationships. A lot of this is dependent on your regional DOT office. Get to know them, get to understand their priorities. Um, your MPO is also a really, your Metropolitan Planning Organization is a really great resource uh, because they know how federal funding works and how it flows and can fund projects if you get it in their work plan. And then lastly, I'll just point out, I, I mentioned this, but stay tuned for spring 2024. Um, we are working on state DOT's active transportation plan right now, and we're going to be doing the stakeholder engagement in the spring. So it's really important to get involved in that process. So if we're trying to get complete streets ASAP, uh, pilots are a great way to cut through red tape, sort of, you know, make, make it not permanent so people don't feel as trepidatious about it, um, and to collect some short-term term data, which can be leveraged into uh, either more funding or a permanent installation. And Times Square is the best example of that. Uh, you know, you had sidewalks that couldn't handle capacity. They closed Broadway. And it's incredible, the transformation. Um, you know, it has become a, a vital public space in New York City and expanded up and down Broadway. Another way to do this is with tag along projects. So for my engineers on the call, if you're doing street millings, that is a prime opportunity to think about complete street designs and road diets. Look, you're gonna rip up the street and repaint it anyway. So it's only a question of changing up how it's painted to create these interventions. So you get a lot of bang for the taxpayer's buck here. So having said that, how do we pay for this? I don't wanna spend a ton of time on this. I will just note that there are a lot of different federal programs out there. There's RAIS, there's uh, Safe Streets and Roads for All, and Myriad. Uh, funding program. So I, I'm not expecting you to read this, but I will send you this matrix. Basically, this lays out every type of complete street infrastructure you can think of and what federal funding programs they're eligible under. At the state level, there's a lot of different funding. Most of it flows from uh, New York State DOT, um, but there are other sources. The Department of Public Health funds uh, complete street improvements through the Creating Healthy Schools and Community programs. And then the Climate Smart Communities Grant Program from DEC also funds some complete street projects. You can also uh, you know, potentially get an easement from property owners. Let's say if you are trying to build a trail businesses, you might get some funding out of them. Let's say if you're trying to improve parking or even if you just want them to maintain something, you can do that. Developers are where the real money is. So Again, one of the reasons that your policy is so important is that you have clear priorities so that when a developer comes into a certain location, you can say, well, listen, uh, if you're going to put your development here, we need to redo our sidewalks. We need to make sure all the curb ramps are ADA compliant and we want a bike lane. So maintenance. So here's the good news. Uh, maintaining complete street infrastructure is really not different from maintaining any other kind of infrastructure. Uh, it's all about paint. Um, a, a protected bike lane might fade a little bit slower than your lane markings, but bottom line is you need to clean periodically, you need to remove litter. Um, it's, it's really not that complicated. Um, one way to think about 
uh, reducing the burden on the public sector if we're worried about maintenance is to create maintenance partnerships. So I mentioned bike corrals before in New York City. One of the things that they did to uh, maintain the bike corral program, as they said, to a local business, uh, look, if you want a bike corral, we'll give it to you um, if you'll be our maintenance partner. And what that means is they sweep, they report any abandoned bikes or broken bike racks or bollards, and a DOT drops off these planters and the business maintains the, the plants and the planters. It's a win-win for the city and the businesses. So, but wait, Dan, what about snow? Uh, the, I, every single Complete Street workshop I do, I, I get this question. So, uh, again, it's it's not it doesn't have to be all that different when we're talking about complete street infrastructure. So when it comes to snow storage and roadway design, if you design your roadways with snow in mind, uh, you know, some of those curb extensions could actually serve as snow storage areas. Also, if you have the budget and the ability to do this, reducing your pavement markings, reducing uh, submerging them three millimeters under the pavement prevents scuffing from plows. Um, flexible bollards are also great because it increases visibility. I mean, you know, if you're in Buffalo, maybe this is less helpful because they're only three feet tall, but um, you will be able to delineate where certain types of infrastructure are even under the snow. In terms of ice mitigation, something to think about is that ice flows to the curb. So as snow melts, it tends to refreeze in bike lanes and other infrastructure that's adjacent to the curb. So you want to make sure that you're just salting and sanding these areas as well, um, in addition to plowing. Beforehand, you can also restrict on-street parking if you're expecting the storm. And then, of course, prioritizing walking and biking routes first to make sure that people are able to use those modes. We have barely scratched the surface on the design piece. There's a lot of tools and resources out there. I suggest you peek through these NACTO guides. Also, uh, Ashto's Bicycle Facilities Guide is about to be updated sometime in 2024, but it's it's what state DOTs look at when they're thinking about bike infrastructure. So the last piece here before we close out, I just want to talk about med performance management. Um, so there's a lot we can measure that is short-term, like crashes, vehicular volume, traffic speed, economic vitality, and user satisfaction. If you do a complete street project, we would expect to see a change in these metrics fairly quickly. And then there are longer term outcomes like environmental outcomes, public health, and public safety, which tend to take a little bit longer to change. First thing you want to do before you even get started is to prioritize those outcomes that are important to your community. If you did your complete street policy right, you've already done this. Determine how you're going to measure those metrics uh, what, what are those metrics and how are you going to measure them? Before you do the project, establish a baseline and then make sure you're periodically evaluating these things to make sure they're working. So traffic data, uh, you can get this from your local police department. This is the go-to for most complete street and roadway projects. Traffic volume, that's how many vehicles, whether it's cars, trucks, bikes, pedestrians, are going through a given space. You can also do vehicle turning counts at intersections to see where traffic is flowing. Traffic speed, um, you know, there's a lot of ways to do this. You can, you know, do a speed study. You can install automated counters. Um, you can also contact your local police department and see if there are high volumes of speeding violations in any particular area in your community. Economic vitality, we can me measure commercial activity through sales tax receipts. We can also look at business engagement by talking to business owners and visitors. Maybe we do some surveys. And then with commercial vacancies, uh, how many vacant storefronts are in your downtown? Um, how many building permits have been issued within a given time frame? So as far as downstream outcomes, again, even if you do a complete street projects, project asthma rates aren't going to change right away, uh, nor are obesity rates. Um, crime rate might go down fairly quickly if you make a place uh, safer, but perceptions of safety uh, on a roadway might take a while to change. Similarly, air quality and water quality, that takes a while to change over time. Um, one resource I'd like to point out is the New York Cycling Census, something we did. It's the largest state statewide survey of cycling ever done in the U.S. Uh, we collected uh, surveys from 13,700 plus New Yorkers 
uh, on all sorts of bike preferences. We did infrastructure ratings in every single county in the state, e-bike propensity, education needs, uh, trip purposes, et cetera. Um, this is a really valuable resource if you're trying to think about data points to support bicycle infrastructure in your community. So with that, uh, that's a lot of stuff. Um, I, mean, I know we have five minutes left, but we're going to flip over. We're going to do the questions. Um, and also I can answer questions while we're doing that. We have so, our first PDH question. What are the benefits of a road diet? Reducing speed through passive, tra through passive traffic calming, narrowing automobile travel lanes, providing road space and non-motorized users, or lastly, all of the above. You guys, a few more seconds. All right, looks like majority, all of the above. Perfect. Next question. We have, what complete street design principle describes decluttering the area immediately around intersections to increase visibility for all roadway users? Intersection widening, intersection daylighting, intersection downsizing, intersection, intersection evacuation. Ooh, tongue twister. For a few more people, I like to get around 75%. Right. The winner was intersection daylighting. And then lastly, PDH question number three. What is a goat path as it relates to complete street design? A, a path for goats. B, unauthorized access to private property. C, evidence of informal tra travel patterns. Or D, unsafe pedestrian paths. I'll give you guys a few more seconds. All right. Evidence of informal travel patterns. Oh my goodness, travel patterns. <laughs> Those are it for the PDH questions. It looks like we have one question in the Q&A and says, many years ago, Buffalo, New York changed its downtown Main Street to an exclusively pedestrian way, but in, re in recently converted it back to traffic. What causes the need to make such reversals? Uh, well, <laughs> what causes the need for a reversal uh a lot of times and i'm not trying to be uh cute but a lot of times it's politics um you, you know there are people that uh, there are very vocal minorities sometimes that uh oppose something and people get elected and things change um now i'm not saying that's what happened in buffalo i am not fully familiar with that project i can get you in touch with who is um but sometimes political whims change these things. We've seen it in Utica. There's clearly, um, you know, there's there's issues all over the state uh, where where this happens. You know, sometimes in in rare cases, uh, data does not support. The, let me put it this way: more often than not, a complete street intervention is going to be a net positive for a community. Now, you might have people who are upset because suddenly they have to drive more or you know there's nowhere to park or one thing or another. But uh, without knowing the specifics of the case in Buffalo, uh, I I can't say the, you know, I I can't say that that specific instance is a, a politically driven decision, but you know, the, these things are safer. The data supports them. These things do spur economic development. The data supports it. Um, there are, you know, a, a pedestrian plaza is is a harder example for me to uh, justify 
as potentially being unsafe. But sometimes, um, you know, you might choose a piece of pedestrian infrastructure or, or bike infrastructure that is underutilized or poorly designed so that it doesn't see high utilization, in which case it makes sense to reevaluate the design. So let's say you put a a bike lane along a stretch of highway and nobody's using it, even though there's demand for, for bike connectivity, maybe it's unsafe. Um, maybe you need to talk to people about why they're not using it. Um, and maybe that wasn't the right intervention. Maybe it should have been a side path instead uh, in order to you know make people feel safer. So it, it really depends on a case by case basis. Uh, there are instances where Maybe we didn't design something right. Typically, when you do a pilot project, that's a good place to test different ideas. And I've seen this uh, in, in different communities where they tried one thing with the pilot and people just really didn't like it. It didn't make them feel safer. They wanted to realign a crosswalk differently than, than the pilot had it laid out. So doing that tinkering at the pilot stage might save you some of that headache down the line. Um, you know, you can't avoid political whims. Uh, but data is really helpful. So do the work up front, test things before you make them permanent. And it, you, you should be better off. In the long run. Okay, that brings us right to 10 o'clock. Thank you so much, Dan. We have a few other questions in the Q&A, but we'll send them to you and David. Yep. Um, everyone stay safe out there and stay warm, and we will see you in the new year. Have a great rest of your Tuesday. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye.